welcome to today's craft chat. I'm going to uh, start the show by introducing myself. I'm Sage Brousseau, Director of Education at Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts. Our mission at Fuller Craft is to provide meaningful discovery of contemporary craft through exhibitions, collections, education, and public programs. We're committed to challenging perceptions and building appreciation of the material world. Our purpose is to inspire, stimulate, and enrich an ever-expanding community. To learn more about our collection, exhibitions, other upcoming virtual and in-person events, or to become a member, please visit us at fullercraft.org. My guest today on the Craft Chat is Michael C. Thorpe, a visual artist living and working out of New York, New York, with a primary focus in textiles. He was taught the art and craft of quilting from his mother, Susan Richards, through the usage of bright colors, organic shapes, and meandering quilting patterns, Michael explores the limitations of both social constructs and textiles. He combines fabrics, imagery, and language to evolve, oh, sorry, to evoke alternate, alternative perspectives on the human experience. And he grew up in Newton, Mass, and graduated from Emerson College with a degree in photojournalism. In February 2020, Michael opened his breakthrough exhibition, All Too Human, at a fashion boutique located on Newbury Street in Boston, followed by a second solo exhibition, Meandering Thoughts at Lai Sun Keen Gallery in Boston from April to May of this year. His work is in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and is primarily represented by Lai Sun Keen Gallery. I'm really excited to have you here today, Michael. Thank you very much. That was, I always forget how much I've done. Um, yeah. well, these <laughs> intros are so great. You did an awesome job. Um, so thank, thank you. you for having me. This is very awesome, especially being with the Craft Museum. I've done a couple of things with, as you said, with the MFA and the ICA, but it's really cool to get into like, my people are people i yeah. like to say yeah yeah and just to follow up with that i'm super cool with like questions going as we're talking because right. that's super fun um so yeah so right now we're in my studio in brooklyn i mean sorry it's actually queens but it's borders brooklyn um where i've been for a year now which is crazy because i used to do all this stuff outside of my mom's um kitchen you know and so now it's very different. So first I would love to just give you guys and you a tour of the studio to see what we're doing. And I have to admit, it, it, we just cleaned it. So this is not like the average looking of it. It's usually really dirty, but you know, after the show and everything, we wanted to clean it up. So how do you, okay, here we go. So this is the space. Um, and as you can see, uh, first of all, there's nothing on the wall because it was all for the show. I haven't been in the studio for about a month or two. Um, but here's like where, you know, all the logistics and stuff go where I meet with my coworkers to discuss what's going to happen. And then this is like the machine that all the magic happens, which is called a long arm quilting machine, um, which is everybody, I, it was funny at my show, I had a lot of people ask me if I had like, I was going to get arthritis and I couldn't understand it. But then I understood a lot of quilting is done on like sit down machines. And this one is one of those machines where you pull a piece of fabric and then you can work on like the X and Y axis and you just move it. So it's pretty cool. I really, really like it. Um, then this is where like a lot of cutting happens. And this is a design wall that my mom taught me how to make, which just felt, and you could just put pieces of fabric on there. And um, obviously, Juki to get everything done. Nice. And this is one of the pieces uh, from my first show at All Too Human, which is a piece of my sister Latoya, um, which I keep in the studio. And trying to figure out, honestly, just trying to convince her that to let me put it in the museum. But you know, we'll we'll get there. So, but right now it's here. Um, and then here's all what I call my paints. So all these lovely, oh, and now it looks so good. Well, to, um, after we did cleaned it up. So you got all the new fabrics here and all loads and loads of threads. So. Very organized. So, yeah, usually not like that at all, to be honest. It's usually, and it, oh, and the one thing I would love to show is that, so this is funny to me because 
the whole ground is like spotless, which is very odd because before it had all my scraps. So I used to, cause I always loved like painters and how they would have like paint splatter and like paint all over everything. But like, obviously I don't experience that. And so then mm -hmm. um, as we were cutting and working and everything, scraps just continued to fall and it wasn't worth picking it up while we were working. And it was really cool. So we had it all over. And so I'm saving them because I have a couple ideas I want to do with them. So, yep, this is the, it was funny. So I worked with this amazing artist photographer named Lou Jones, who's based in Boston. As you had mentioned, uh, I went to school for photography at Emerson College. So I really thought I was going to do that. And then when um, I obviously I discovered uh, quilting through my mom, that it just like took off. But it was really funny because I had always seen those portraits of artists that are like usually done by other artists, but who are photographers. And I was like, oh man, I can't wait for like my first like artist photo. And I, this was with Lou. And I literally said, Lou, I would love a Lou Jones photograph. All I needed to do is like present me and my work. And so here it is. So this is the thing I've been using for like a year now and I, can, I will continue to use it. So here is um, the photo of me and my mom actually in the kitchen where I used to work. Actually, it's technically the dining room. And it was just so funny because growing up, I had never noticed. So I played basketball. I played basketball. And then I ended up playing four years of collegiate basketball at Emerson. And um, there was always like crafts and quilts and like embroidery, needlework, you like name it, it was always around the house, but I never took notice to it, um, especially the quilts because they were um, always just like functional quilts. But then it was really funny because I realized the other day, not the other day, when I started saying that, like I never realized they were art. My mom always had quilts that she would only put up on the wall and, mm -hmm. and then she had quilts she would only use on the couch. So I was really just oblivious to the whole fact of like how integrated craft was into my family, especially my mom. And so then when we started, when I took an interest into it, it was really interesting because after basketball, because my mom was so supportive of my basketball career, was always at the games. And we really bonded over that. And then after the, like my career ended, um, I was like, dang, what, what are we going to do next? Like, what is going to be our next bonding experience? And then all of a sudden I took up uh, quilting. And then this was just like off to the races because she really taught me everything. And the funniest part I think about our relationship in terms of quilting is like when I was living at the house was um, she's like an expert master quilter, like quilting for like over 40 years. And um, I'm like very, I would say avant-garde mm -hmm. and like I would be like trying to do something and like she'll be like walking past the dining room and I'm just like struggling, struggling, struggling for like a long time. And then she would just come by and she was like, oh, you know, you could just do this. And I was just like, you, you've seen me struggle on this for hours. Like, why didn't you tell me this before? And it's like kind of just being like, see, I, no matter how big and popular you get, I still have a leg up on you. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a competition. No, I wouldn't say a competition. <laughs> it's just like a, it's a humbling thing. Like yeah. it's more yeah. of like, you still got a long way to go. Like, That's great. That's actually really supportive. Like you probably felt a little bit like, like you said, hey, why are you holding back on me? But that's really great that she's allowed you to sort of like find your way. Um, Cause I imagine, um, I imagine maybe your quilting style is probably a lot different from your mom's. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thought, and it's, re that? yeah, it's really funny because um, I was always fascinated. So we had, so I, before I really figured out what I wanted to do with quilting, I obviously learned how to like make a, what I would call a qu traditional quilt. And I was always fascinated by the idea of like, you pretty much getting told what to do. Like, here's the pattern, here's the fabric, here's the quilting uh, pattern you can use. And if you put it all together, it'll look like what's on the wall that we're showing you. And I always thought it was so interesting. When I finally figured out that you can pretty much make anything out of fabric and thread, it was like off to the races for me. And it was so funny, like once, um, really when my mom started teaching me applique, I was like, oh, this is amazing. And um, I remember I like, made one of my first pieces um, and just like ripped it off the machine and showed my mom and it didn't have any finished edges. And she was like, it's not done. I was like, what are you talking about? It's super done. She was like, it's, you, gotta, you gotta bind the quilt. I was like, no, you don't. 
And it was like, then it was like a funny tip. And I, I was jokingly saying at the show, like, you know, that's why she kicked me out. But um, it was so funny that like, she let, yeah, she let really let me be me, but then she definitely like stays like tried and true to like her ideology of quilting. But it's like beautiful because like we support each other. And like, it's funny now, cause like my friends always joke that like, and which is not a joke, but they do joke that like, my mom is a way better quilter than me, which I will always say is true. So this is, I always include this in like come of my talks because this is a crazy piece because, um, so I had made, so I, as I said, I made that first quilt, like just figuring out how to make a quilt. And then I started making more and more and more. And then my mom one day was like, do you want to see your first quilt? And I was like, ha ha ha, it's right there. And she was like, no. And she goes into the, like the closet and pulls this out and, a, and this quilt, I actually made, I this still blows my mind. I made back in 2004, mm -hmm. um, which would, I would have been like, uh, to quick math, uh, it was like 15 years ago, I think, maybe more. Um, and so I would have been like super young mm -hmm. in like- Middle school? Yeah, almost middle school, which is super interesting because like I was just all about sports. And like, obviously like I would doodle all the time and I was always into like arts, but like it was like, kind of one of those things especially back then I feel like it was like you had to choose one I think now is a little bit more like mm -hmm. you could do two things or anything and so she pulled this out and I was just like blown away that like I had already had this like lineage and this heritage with the um with the craft of quilting that I didn't even notice and it's actually funny I actually keep it in my studio now so I don't know exactly what I'm gonna do it will definitely be shown somewhere but it's like just so meaningful that like way back in the day and the thing i love about this one the most is the bubbles that how they're, they're just like wonky and that was always just like <laughs> i feel like just a hint to like where i was going because as mm. you see and you will see in my work i really don't like like obviously i stopped taking photos but i didn't i never really liked like perfection so this is where it all started i feel like once i finally took the leap of um figuring out what i wanted to do as an artist um with the a quilting um, and I was extremely, so when I was trying to figure out, um, the arts, cause I came from such a radically different background in the sports, I kind of just applied the same ideology that I do in sports to arts. And I was like, okay, when we're, I was playing basketball, I just looked up to the best basketball players and just like kind of mimic them. And so I just really transferred that ideology over to arts. And the first person I stuck with was Basquiat. I mean, he was the one that was the easiest one to like get like a lot of information on and especially somebody who looked like myself mm -hmm. and so really I just like dove head first and that's the thing I realized about my artistic practice is like I had to go all the way through something to see if I like it on the other side and mm -hmm. so yeah so I really started making these pieces and they were really fascination I mean a very fascinating exploration because I would tell you these pieces were extremely hard to make and then the funny thing is they were even harder to talk about. So I was like sitting there being like, I don't think this is what art's supposed to be. Like, this is so hard and like, it's not that fun. And so then after I finally like decided that this wasn't it for me, I started to turn the page and then you have this one. <laughs> and this was like the really the beginning of the like, I don't know, just the beginning. I really say like the beginning of like what I am today. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is a self portrait. And I don't remember what like, I don't know what artists or anything. I just remember thinking about back to photography. And I started thinking about photography and started thinking about like actually seeing the world and um, how I see the world and how like photography is so flat and like um, I just learned mm -hmm. that's the first thing I ever did in art was seeing the world through this like flat plane and so then I started like really doodling again it was really funny I have some of these really really old sketches about and then I started thinking about quilting and like how it is like quilting is made where you you have these fabrics that you layer on top of each other and it's really hard to I think it's really hard to like add a lot of like dimension and it's not that hard, but I just choose not to do it. And um, then I just started like kept drawing, kept drawing, kept drawing. And then I noticed that all my figures because I was working with quilts were all built out of shapes, like all these very, very simple shapes. And so then I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. And 
starting off, I was really um, attracted to it, which I very much am still attracted to G's Bend quilting mm. and the like asymmetrical work. And that was like the first thing. And I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. It's like when in photography, I very much took like portraits. That was probably my primary like subject yeah. matter. And so okay. I just went right back into that. And this was like the first one. And then after I did this, like everything made sense. Like I could speak about this. It was really fun to see this come to life. It was like, this is what art is about to me. Like mm -hmm. my whole ideology of like just living is just having fun, you know, trying your best and having fun. Like it's just, and that's what this like encapsulated. And so then it was like off to the races after this. This was like the first one. And I'm really happy because this was at my show. Oh, perfect timing, perfect timing. Cause I was gonna say that was at my show, which is right there. Oh man, they would have thought we like rehearsed that. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so that piece was at my show and it was actually the most sought after piece at my show. And it was funny cause we did like a, um, I don't know what they're like a pre-opening or like the, the mm -hmm. show before the show mm -hmm. for most it was mainly because a lot of my friends couldn't make it because they're going to be out of town that weekend so i was like oh let's do you guys come by before and um it was funny my mom was there and my mom was constantly saying like that piece like was her favorite piece the self-portrait and she was always like pointing people there she was like oh you should check out the piece downstairs it's my favorite and i just kept hearing that and i was just like well, you know, I'm not gonna sell that piece. I'm gonna give it to my mom. And it's like, I'm really happy to say that now hanging in my mom's house, oh. um, which is like, yeah, it really means the world to me. Cause um, it's funny. Cause like when you start really going into the art world um, and you start moving pieces, like next thing you know, like as you see my studio is like empty, which um, I have a bunch of friends who like, we have this long dialogue about how you feel about like, you're not having your work or like yeah. selling your work. Yeah. Uh, but I'm super cool with it because like it gives me it provides me the lifestyle that I want to live and also if like I have all my work it's not like doing its job out in the world like I want it to enrich other people's lives that's a really that's a really good way to put that I, I wouldn't have thought sometimes you know as an artist myself I do struggle with that like if I work really hard on a piece I don't want to let it go mm -hmm. um right away but then mm -hmm. I love how you said that like you know if it's not out in out there in the world it's not um speaking to other people yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's exactly how i think about it because i mean you wrote it like i think that's why i'm so interested in like of course i love having my work in private collections but i'm really interested more to try and, and i feel like any artist is and hopes to get into more museums because then you know like it's going to be preserved and last forever mm -hmm. and hopefully it's shown so often um which exciting uh, field note is I'm actually going to be the work that is at the MFA is actually going to be displayed in October because nice. they're having yeah they're having a um, quilting show that um, I forgot exactly what it's called um, but it's going to be displayed which is super I mean like surreal like dude I'm just a year into the game and I'm already getting shown in a group it's crazy another thing is it's my, it's my first group show and it just happens to be at museum just uh, blows my mind every day um so yeah so this is like well these obviously you see latoya in the back and so like these were like some of like the standout pieces um from my show my first show at all to human and it was really interesting the thing i thought about the most um with this show uh, obviously not going to art school not showing tradition at a traditional gallery you know showing at one of these concept clothing stores um, but I knew like I had worked at the Museum of Fine Arts for a little bit. Like I knew a couple people at galleries. So I knew there would be some like art people coming. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing I thought about, to be honest, was um, scale. Like I always remember going to museums and just being like amazed by scale. I was like, wow. Like I feel like that really separates artists where it's like, damn, mm -hmm. we could really make something that big. Like you clearly are doing it you know and I, obviously i don't now i don't think that's true like truly true because like, i actually think making smaller pieces is so much harder than making big pieces especially in quilting um and so it was really interesting um but that was the one thing i was like really really fascinated and like fixated on in that show because um especially like the i think we ended up being like i think close to 20 pieces which um, I still think was like a massive undertaking. That's but then I also wanted people to be like, whoa, those are really big pieces. 
Yeah. Um, I love this one on the right. Is that a self-portrait as well? Or is that another? Yeah, no. So that is uh, my best friend who had lived with me for uh, multiple years in Newton. And it was actually one of, uh, it was a portrait of him at the basketball court that was behind my house that we played at all the time. And it was cool. It was really interesting. I really want to get back into this style. Um, I love it. I will. Yeah, I yeah, love it's, how it's like subdued background. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a doodle. Uh, tell, tell us a, a, about how you conceptualize this technique because it's really, really interesting. Yeah, and another thing I've been learning a lot about the art is like a lot of the idea, I, well, I'll speak for myself, I'm not gonna speak for the greater artist population, but a lot of the ideas and concepts and really construction of things is really married to time, you know? Mm. And I, so I saw this space and so long, a quick ana anecdote about how the show came about was I basically got this interview, again, crazy, from NPR. And they basically were like, oh, are you, do you have a show coming up? And at this point, I didn't even consider myself an artist. I was like, oh, uh, let, me, uh, let me get back to you. And I really like, that's how I got to the show at this place. Um, and I just knew they could like expedite the process. And so fast forward to making these pieces. So I so I made the Latoya piece like long before and it was a massive piece. And then looking at the space, I was like, I really want to like basically fill up everything in this place. And there was like two massive walls. And at the time, I wasn't really that good at what you would see later of like basically piecing mm. scenes together. And on top of that, I was working a full nine to five job. And, but then I came up with this idea of what if I just stitch the background and if I just make it, if I fill it in enough, you will be able to tell what it is. And it really, to be honest, it was a shot in the dark because I had never tried it before. I was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I need to make these, I mean, make a couple really big pieces, but I don't have time, but I wanted to have this like this interesting subject matter. And so then um, that's how it actually came about. So I remember like literally drawing it on. So what I end up doing with these pieces is, and it's still to this day, I use the same style, I mean, um, procedure, but I have these amazing um, pens that um, you can draw on like fabric, but then when you put an iron to it, it like mm -hmm. erases it, which is yeah. sick. <laughs> uh, which again, my mom taught me, I mean, my mom showed me. And so, yeah, I would draw, I drew out this whole scene and um, then literally just put it on the machine and started like just piecing it. I mean, I was just coloring it in basically. And it was really funny. It was just long nights just going up and down and up and down and up and down and then just meandering and filling in things. But then it was like, when it came out, like it was like beautiful. And I was like really excited, to, especially with the pop of the figure. Um, really? So that's really how it went. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I love how the figure pops from the background. I love how you're like, experimenting and breaking rules and just doing things that I, I don't think many of us have seen on quilts before. This one was interesting because at the time, which I still am, but it's like, I'm like trying to figure out, but at the time I was really fascinated in um, text, like actual text. And um, I don't know, I was really, I've always been gravitated towards. And so I actually used this as a piece, which I kind of said was like my artist statement like, you know, you always see those artist statements on the wall that's like um, okay. vinyled onto the walls and stuff at museums. So I kind of use this as what I wanted to say as my artist statement, which again, looking at artists, I was really, I'm really into like Richard Prince, who just appropriates everything. I appropriated this from the G's Ben book and what how they described like the G's Ben quilters, which I thought related perfectly to what I was doing. Um, and then it was funny because then it was just another means of like filling up a space where it was like, I knew it wouldn't take that long to do it. But then I really underestimated how long it took to cut out all those letters. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that, that was the thing. And then it's interesting how I like kind of, I don't really work with text that much, but I, I love that I keep trying things and putting it out in the, the world that I can always just go back into, you know? And this brings me to this. And so I was really fascinated um, 
how I think I believe it's John Baldessari who uses words and like it just kind of like tells it how it is. And so I was really fascinated in the idea of um, when you read something, um, you make up your own image. Like when you read a book, you like have this whole imagery, you make up your own world. And it was really funny, side note was I was trying to reread like the Harry Potter series. And then I like started reading the first one. I just literally saw the movie and I was like, this isn't enjoyable at all. And so that I had this idea that I still work with um, of like when you read something, like you make your own images. And so the, the work on the right that says black man was, is actually the work that the MFA acquired. And it was actually, I wouldn't consider myself like a reactionary artist, um, but basically when all the uprisings were happening over the last summer with George Floyd's death, um, I just got like, oh, swept up in the thing. I felt like I had to do something. And so I made this piece and I was just like making this commentary of like, what do people see when they think of a black man, you know? And um, so, yeah, that's what that piece was about. And then I had this like partner with like black woman because I had this whole idea, which I might still investigate of like just having a bunch of pieces varying in size and um, color and everything of just words of like how you describe um, people, you know, and see like where it goes with that. Yeah. And so moving on through that idea, I was thinking of this idea of how you can use words and images in the same context and like opening up a new a new world where now like I have this like I had this picture of my friend sitting at a poolside um, smoking a cigarette and I was like oh, I wonder if I just put swimming pool the word swimming pool and how where what is your relationship with those words like how would you envision a swimming pool is it a big swimming pool or is it like a small swimming pool and so those were the ideas I was working with going through these explorations. Can you talk a little bit about um, the fabrics you choose and, and specifically the, the cloth, the background cloth in these two pieces? Yeah, um, so a lot of the cloth, the fabrics I use are really given to me. So um, it's a lot of just like scraps, uh, and not scraps because it with my mom being a quilter, it's really a family affair because my aunt her sister owns a quilt shop in New Hampshire. So I get a ton of fabric from her. And then all of a sudden a really funny thing started to happen once I like presented myself as a, um, as a um, artist that uses fabrics was that like everybody would start sending me fabrics. Everyone's like, oh, I have this huge bag of textiles. Would you like it? And of course I said, yes. And so then I got so much fabric that I was like, okay, a lot of this I'm not going to use. So I had to start curating it. Um, yeah, it, they're, they're beautiful. I mean, I love the, the way you use color. I love the way you use pattern, um, not only the fabric, but all the way, the way you incorporate pattern into your stitching. So these pieces are not, are like irregularly shaped, right? So are these, so these are just pinned up on something in the, uh, in these two photographs, right? Correct. So like though that they're pinned up to the design wall at mm -hmm. my mom's house, the same design wall that I have in my studio. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting. One of the things I've been learning a lot with um, textiles specifically is how to like, cause when I first started making work, I, um, I would just stretch the pieces and staple through them to like a normal painting frame. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was sick because I really wanted them to feel more like a painting than like a quilt. I didn't want them to be wave everyone. So I wanted to be like a structure on the wall. And so then when my gallerist, Lai Sun, came to my studio visit, uh, she was like, oh, these are staples. And I was like, yeah, this is sick, right? And she was like, yeah, no, it's really cool. But like, these are going to like degrade and like, how are you going to preserve them? And I was just like, preserve them. I was like, we don't need to preserve them. And I'm obviously being super naive. And she was saying that like you, they would, one, you have to treat textiles like works on paper. They're very fragile. You know, you, they get damaged. It's really hard to, one, you can't really fix them and you can't really clean them, you know? And um, she was like, I think you should, we should really just put them behind glass. I was like really hesitant to that idea at mm -hmm. first because I was like, I want them to be like very like, immediate you know and then when they they were like no trust us we'll watch we'll put it behind glass and then you will 
you could tell us how you feel. And then they did, and I was like blown away at how good it looked and like, um, and it was just like that. That's like at the end of the day, that's how I want them to be presented, just because it does really like take care of them for the long haul. Which like, of course, as a young buck, I don't think about any time. But well, you know, that's one of those things that you like. You're talking about your journey, and it's really interesting to hear, you know, how you're learning like each step of the way. Um, you know, and, and it's, um, it's nice to be upfront about that and that, you know, that this is a part of the process. It's not like we all come out of the gate knowing exactly, um, what to do and how to treat our medium. So it's, it's great to hear that. Yeah. It is so fascinating to me when I hear artists talk and there's like, I mean, I mean the whole, I mean, I feel, I feel like the whole, one of the major problems in my opinion about the art world is like the encrypted like knowledge that the art mm -hmm. world has everybody wants to be like oh i i struggled for this so you got to figure it out yourself i was like no you've got to basically ask questions and like hopefully people are transparent with you and tell you hey right, man we're just figuring it out too so yeah so this is now now getting into more of what i i think i'm doing today which is so fascinating i haven't seen these pieces in so long to be honest it's so cool to see like the progression like so this was I was doing last summer um, when we were in lockdown and it was very interesting to just, cause I was just like, it's still, I wasn't represented, really didn't know what the next move was. I knew I just wanted to make art. I just like kept making people and, and it started to work out. They're gorgeous. I love, so you're primarily doing portraits. Is this, that's accurate? Yep. And now perfect segue because now, so, so the first show, I think everything was portraits, like everything was somebody, you know? And I'm the big thing about me as an artist is I'm like so petrified of being like pigeonholed into like, you only do this. Um, but then as I work through it, I realize, oh, I can just do whatever I want. And one of the big things I was thinking about, but then I started to also like embrace the like quilt artist thing because one, there's really not a lot of male quilters and there's not a lot of black male quilters. And then I learned about uh, Stanford Biggers and I was like, all right, he's doing his thing. So it's all cool. Um, and so then, so with this show, so then um, at the end of the summer or middle of summer, I got introduced to Lai Sun and mm -hmm. she was really excited about my work. And then we ended up talking about getting represented um, and then she was like, okay, I would love to do a show for you. And I was like, oh, amazing, let's do it. So then this show that uh, just came down, um, it was so interesting thinking about it as a whole and as a process because the first show, to be quite frank, I was just like put everything I had in my house up on the walls and then I would make sense of it afterwards, you know? Cause mm -hmm. like, it's the biggest thing I learned, I was always noticing with artists that I was really attracted to was yeah, they had the work to put up on the wall or like they had the work, either conceptual, whatever it was. But then the biggest thing I noticed is they talked about it in such different ways. Like just because it looked like this, they talked about something else. And I was like, okay, that's definitely. And I thought about that with my first show, um, but after the fact. And then this show, I definitely wanted it all to be premeditated. And so the biggest thing, and then it was funny because I was really, really like thinking, I was like, oh, I'm gonna make this so like intellectual. And like, it's gonna be so, it's gonna knock people's socks off. And then I was just like, one day I remember being like, that's not who I am at all. Like, I'm not like a dude that's like highly like thought based work. And so I really thought about the, just this near, I just really thought about my life at the moment. And I was like, holy moly, I am really living the dream. You know, I'm living my wildest dream wow. as being a living, working artist in New York, like successfully, like I, every day I just wake up and make art, you know, and I, I literally basically do what I want to do every single day. And so then the thing I wanted to, basically the whole concept for this, this new show was my new wildest dreams. Now that I fact that I did this, like what was my next thing? And this is um, the, basically like, the, I would say like the grand slam of the show. And this is like my wildest dream. And it's a family portrait that actually doesn't exist because I didn't grow up with my father. I was just raised by my mother. And I'm the youngest of six, but I only have one like full blood sibling who is uh, on the right. 
And so this whole concept was um, basically this almost like fantasy of like, maybe what if I grew up with him? Not saying it's any better or any worse, but like, what if? And then it also, all the pieces in the show deal with um, the past, the present and the future. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was thinking about with the previous piece was that, um, what if we all got together now, you know, like, what would that be like, you know, thinking about like, I have the courage to like, bring us all together and see what it'd be like. And so that I go like, then going forward, each piece is just another one of these like new fantasies and realities, because this one is my Brooklyn home, my first Brooklyn home since I just moved, um, that I like moved into, which has a couple of like imaginary pieces, but also a lot of like realistic depictions in this. And it was like kind of thinking about that, how important um, home ownership is, you know? And like, that is one, like, that's my wildest dream is to own a home, you know? And um, thinking of like my up uh, bringing where we never owned homes, you know? And thinking about like, how, like, honestly, it's crazy to me now that like, all these things that I was like, oh, this might happen. It's like, but then of course I was taking this like contrarian route of being an artist. And like for all I knew, all the artists I knew were broke. And I was like, well, you know, it was a good dream. And now being like, oh man, like I can actually potentially do this. So, and- Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say that, um, that I was bringing these two up, going back to your first statement about portraiture and the one of the things that I the biggest thing I thought about with the show was I wanted to do basically being this being my first like gallery show I wanted to do basically almost every subject matter I could think of because um, as I said before like doing it putting it out in the world and even if you don't do it work on that idea or subject again it's already there and so when you re-bring it up people won't be like whoa this is so like out of character I'm like We've already done this so that was a big thing I thought about so this show had like pretty much everything you can think of in terms of subject matter well and kind of speaking of that I'm seeing a lot of like, I want to compare it to two specific artists and I'm curious if anybody's ever said this to you one I'm seeing Romare Bearden mm. and, and two I'm seeing like Matisse especially in the last one with the um and it's I, I hadn't noticed those comparisons before but they're like so they're really strong and I'm not, I'm, I'm curious if you have any intentional, you know, influence or just you've, you, things that you've absorbed. I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about your influences. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the classic state, as I said earlier, earlier on when you just, you're just standing on the shoulders of giants. And so when I really started making the work, the very, very first work that was very Basquiat inspired, mm -hmm. yep. one of my friends was like, oh, this this reminds me of, this is like a mix between Basquiat and Romari Bearden. And I was like, one, sick, but also two, who's Romari Bearden? And so then I did a really <laughs> big deep dive into him and I was just like blown away yeah. that he basically made his career off like collages, you know? Yeah. And that's another thing that, uh, I'm actually working on now, but we'll get to that later. And yeah, I really love Romari Bearden's work and definitely a huge influence on me. And then going to Matisse, it's actually really funny. I ended up seeking, I like, obviously I knew Matisse for painting, but then somebody was like, dude, you should look at his cutouts. Like his cutouts are like what you need to know. And that was like, then after seeing that literally and I actually use his cutouts in like my paperwork too. Like I'm like, it's very inspired by it because it's like literally the same thing. And yeah, and then just seeing him, how he uses work um, and color and yeah, two major influences on me. And it's one of those things where I constantly look at, like I'm always trying to find new artists to be inspired by and just pull from. And yeah, those are two major influences for me. I'm curious to see um, or hear more about what you're thinking of next. You kind of alluded to it. I have a, a question really quickly because we are starting to run out of time, but um, there is a, a question about um, your process. And then the question is, do you draw on fabric before using the machine, um, the big long arm? Mm -hmm. uh, and could you explain a little bit more about how that, that specific machine works? 
Sure. Yeah. So I really, I feel like very fortunate that I figured out this process and it's pretty much like a assembly line. Mm -hmm. And so basically what I do is I'll draw it out. And it was, it's always funny to me to like, look how much I've grown. So I used to just draw it out on paper and put up like a big piece of muslin or whatever size muslin I wanted to work on and then tr enlarge it. But I would be like enlarging it from like, I'll look and I'd like, and I'd be like halfway through and I was like, realize it's all out of proportion and I would just have to start over. And, and then I got um, exposed to the iPad and projector and I was like, oh, this is sick. And so now I draw it on the iPad and project it to scale and then trace it. And then after, like, after it's drawn, it's pretty much like tracing because I'll trace it to enlarge it. And then I'll put fabric down and trace on the fabric. And then either I will or my coworker will start cutting out all the shapes. And it's funny since now they're getting quite complex. We have to like bundle all the, the fabrics because like if we just had a bunch of loose random looking pieces, we won't know if this goes to that plant or this goes to that. It's like, it's, it's really chaotic. Um, and then after it's all cut out, I'll put it all back on like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And then I would like have, if you look really closely at a lot of my work, you'll see a bunch of like ink markings because I'll just basically like put indicators or like, hey, so when I put this back on the machine to uh, stitch down, I'll know it like fits here and I'll stitch it down. And then, and then it's like building back it when you're putting them all down. So it's funny when I first like, I was like, oh, it's not, a, it's not that complicated. Then I explained it first time to somebody. I was like, oh yeah, it's very complicated. Do you um, work on more than one piece at a time? No, not really. I really, I always fancy the painters that like have like multiple paintings up and they're just like walking around. I find it really difficult to work on one piece at a time because it's so systematic. And that like after it's done drawn and like once you start cutting it out, it's really like, yeah, I really, really found it hard. But I was thinking about that the other day where I was like, man, what if I had another, like a bigger studio, obviously a bigger studio and another machine, maybe I would work on it another time. But like once you put it on the machine, you can't do uh, another piece yeah. until it's yeah. off the machine. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, so we have to wrap this up, which is killing me. But um, tell us, let's project to the future a little bit. What's next for you? Do you see yourself teaching? You know, do you do any teaching? Do you see yourself teaching? Where, where, where are you going next? I know you alluded to some new projects. I don't personally see myself teaching. Um, I probably would do it, but I personally don't see myself teaching because honestly, I got, I have a lot of shows coming up. I'm looking at three shows this year um, and I just, they are mostly all solo shows. I'm so over solo shows, um, but I got three <laughs> shows this year. Um, and then right, right now, one on the docket for next year, and then one in 2023. Um, and I mean, really on the, one of my game plan is really like, I think the biggest thing I gotta think about now is like, now that I have something going for me now, it's like, and I hate to say this, but like, whatever, like try to, to legitimize myself in the art world. I'm like looking at residencies. Um, nice. There's been a couple talk, a little bit of talk of maybe going back to school for my master's, but I just don't want to do that. Um, so we're really looking at residencies and yeah, and then just keep making work. And I think I want to, um, and then it's like also like knowing that I have this beautiful like thing with quilting, I do want to expand my practice. You know, I definitely at the end of the day, I hope I'm a multidisciplinary artist that like the quilting is like my Picasso paintings, you know, like it's like boom, but then there's like, it just, I tried everything. Yeah, that's great. I feel like we have really kind of just scratched the surface. I, we talked briefly before and I, and I feel like there's so much more to your story, but we are out of time. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing your work at the MFA this fall. I hope that um, we can say hi in person then. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And um, I'm, I'm psyched to follow you as you, I mean, you're, you're really starting out right now and you have so much ahead of you. I'm really psyched to, to keep following you. Um, and maybe someday we'll see some of your work at Florida Craft Museum too.
I would love, love, <laughs> love that. That would be amazing. Let's stay in touch. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Michael, thanks again. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, on behalf of myself and all of my colleagues at Fuller Craft Museum, um, thanks for chatting. Thanks for your questions out there. And um, I hope to see you all again soon. Please visit us at fullercraft.org and have a great rest of your day.